Sonia. She's uh, here with us tonight. She's a certified veterinary technician here at North Star Vets. She's worked in general practice before coming to North Star Vets. Um, she's been on our internal medicine team for a number of years and has built an extensive knowledge base of everything internal medicine. And she's going for a VTS in small animal internal medicine, which I'm very proud to hear. So uh, without any further ado, Anya, I'll turn the stage over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank uh, Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, if I'm a little bit awkward, I'm sorry. This is my first webinar, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to put my computer on share screen so I can play the uh, the presentation with you guys. So if you can't see it, let me know, but I will switch it over now. Oh, God. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Phil, do you see that? Um, I don't see your uh, thing though. So you're hitting share the screen, right? Yeah, hold on. Please hold. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Excellent. You see it now? All good? Yep. Awesome. Wanted to take a moment and show you this awesome picture of my cat. So that's Danny, my cool cat, who makes a little um, scene in this in this presentation. So, um, so here we go. I guess I'll get started. Um, so, pretty much, we have to start with what is the respiratory system. Um, I love this picture because we all know brachycephalic breeds um, cannot breathe. <laughs> um, so I just thought it was funny that breathing is a privilege, not a right, at least for these awful, awful cute babies. Um, so respiration itself is the process of bringing oxygen from the outside air into the body cells and it carries carbon dioxide out in the opposite direction. It's responsible for a couple of other things. Um, so voice production or phonation. Um, so the sound is uh, produced as the air vibrates through the larynx, the laryngeal folds and the pharynx. So that's how we get, uh, or how they get their noise. The respiratory system actually also regulates body temperature. Um, so there's superficial blood vessels in the nasal passages um, that warm the air before it enters the lungs. And obviously, as you know, uh, dogs who pant, they're trying to cool themselves off. Um, it assists in acid-base balance regulation. So normal blood pH is anywhere between 7.35 to 7.45, so it's very, very tightly controlled. Um, and the respiratory system is able to control that ability to influence the amount of um, CO2 in the blood. And then obviously, uh, most, you know, uh, obviously the sense of smell is that there's receptors in the nasal passages. So whatever they smell, that's all due to the respiratory system. Um, we're dividing the respiratory system into two categories. So there's upper respiratory and the lower respiratory system. The upper respiratory consists of the nose, pharynx, larynx, and trachea. And then the lower respiratory system is pretty much the lungs. The lungs include the bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli, ducts and the and the alveoli so two separate parts um, we're going to start with the upper um, respiratory system first so we're going to start from top to bottom um, so we have the nose the nose consists of the nares the nasal passages turbinates nasal septum and sinuses there's receptors for sense of smell they condition the inhaled air so it warms it humidifies and filters all the air the pharynx is the throat um, that is the common pathway for res uh, respiratory and digestive systems, but the soft palate divides it into the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. Because obviously you don't want food going down into the trachea. Um, we have the larynx, also known as the voice box. That connects the pharynx with the trachea. And the larynx also consists of the epiglottis, so that's that little floppy thing we have to pull down while we're intubating uh, a dog or a cat. We have the arytenoid cartilages, which are the flaps on the side that is uh, annoying in cats. You know, they always like to not stay open. So we have to use, you know, lidocaine or, or a stylet. And then we have our thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage. And then we have our trachea. So the trachea is that long tube from the larynx to the thorax where it bifurcates to two main bronchi at the level of the base of the heart. 
Um, it's made of incomplete hyaline rings and it's completed by smooth muscle. Our lower respiratory system um, is pretty much once the trachea bifurcates, we are now the lower respiratory system. We're now in the lungs. We are now going down into our respiratory tree. Um, so the air passageways um, starts from the two main bronchus, which again comes from the trachea. Then we go through smaller bronchi and then even smaller bronchi and then tiny uh, bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and then alveolar sacs. Um, O2 and CO2 exchange happen in the alveoli. Okay, and this is all happening in the lungs, which are divided into lobes. Um, there's three on the left side, right on the, or four on the right. And then it's all connected in the middle by something called the hilus. That's where blood, air, lymph fluid, nerves enter and leave the lungs. Um, now this little blip here is kind of important to remember later on when we talk about certain diseases, just a little uh, A&P refresher of the pulmonary circulation. So you, as you may know, the blood enters the right side of the heart and is pumped out by the right ventricle into the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. This is when your blood is very dark because it's high in carbon dioxide and low in oxygen. And this is the blood that's returned um, to the heart after it's delivered all of the oxygen to the rest of the body. So it's coming back up to dump the, the CO2 back. So now that blood is traveling through the lungs into the capillary networks around the alveoli, this is where the gas exchange happens. Now our blood is bright red. We have high oxygen levels so, uh, and low carbon dioxide. And this blood travels through the pulmonary veins and leaves the lungs um, through the left side of the heart and then is circulated throughout the body. So a quick refresher about how, you know, how the blood flows. There's a couple breathing controls. Thought this little video was cute. I think we've all seen this gif of this sneezing palm, really adorable. So we have the sneeze. A sneeze is a reflex stimulated by irritation or foreign matter in the nasal passages. A cough is a reflex stimulated by irritation or foreign matter in the lungs and or trachea. Um, pretty much a cough is a forceful expiration of air. It could be productive versus non-productive. A yawn, which hopefully uh, most of you guys don't do during this, um, <laughs> is a slow, deep breath stimulated by a slight decrease in oxygen level in the blood. Or due to boredom, drowsiness, fatigue in animals, it can be due to stress as well, they can yawn. A sigh is a slightly deeper than normal breath. It is a mild corrective action when the oxygen blood level is a little too low or the carbon dioxide level is a little too high. Under anesthesia, this is why every couple of minutes we want to give a big manual breath um, to these animals under anesthesia so we can expand their lungs completely, prevent any partial collapse of the lungs, because obviously we've taken away their ability to do that because they're under anesthesia, right? So we now we kind of have to keep their lungs going, make sure that they can expand their lungs um, to their fullest once in a while so we get that oxygen flowing very well. Um, and then my favorite word or medical word, so hiccups, is actually called a synchronous diaphragmatic flutter. Um, awesome new medical term I learned. <laughs> so it's a spasmodic contraction of the diaphragm accompanied by sudden closure of the glottis. Usually, as you know, it's pretty harmless and temporary, um, but it can be caused by nerve, dam or nerve irritation, indigestion, um, or brain damage. But again, most of the time that we see, it's pretty normal. So there's a couple abnormal breathing noises as well. So again, just going back to sneezing, it's only abnormal when it's persistent. As you know, you and I are dogs and cats. If we sneeze once in a while, it's no big deal. Um, but it's only abnormal when we notice that it becomes a pattern and they're sneezing every single day or at the same time during the day or during a, uh, the same activity and things like that. Reverse sneezing, we'll see. Usually it's um, related to allergies or nasopharyngeal irritation or inflammation or a foreign body. Um, I do not do a very good impression of reverse sneezing, so I will definitely not be doing that. Um, but I'm sure we all know what that sounds like. The two, uh, I think, and at least for me, most important words are stertor and strider. Um, so stertor is a coarse, audible snoring or snorting sound um, every time they're breathing, while a strider is a high-pitched wheezing sound. Um, I have a couple of videos to show you, kind of explain the difference between those. 
Um, now I'm pretty sure I know everyone can pretty much hear that picture <laughs> there. We've all seen a dog kind of yak like that. Um, you know, there he is coughing. And again, we can have a productive versus a non-productive cough. Um, so it can be uh, mucus, it can be an exudate, um, edema fluid or blood. Um, wet sound is often heard with it. Um, it's rarely an expectorate fluid, but swallowing is commonly seen after a cough. So maybe most of the time they are bringing something up, but again, they're just already so quick to swallow it that, you know, we don't see anything coming up. And again, it's often confused as vomiting. Obviously, cats are difficult. They normally don't cough. So a lot of people, you know, um, it might actually be that they're bringing up a hairball. A lot of people confuse it with a hairball, but the cats rarely cough. If they do, definitely there's something going on. And then kind of another vocabulary word, hemoptysis, is just the word for coughing up blood. So a couple videos just to show you um, what's going on. The first one here is going to be of a strider. So I'll play that again one more time. So obviously that's a strider, it's a higher pitched. Um, again, we'll commonly see those in our laryngeal paralysis dogs. Um, that's pretty much what they sound like when they come in. The next video is gonna be of a stirter. So you're gonna see the difference between what these two sound like. <laughs> Sounds terrible. Yeah, so that is all upper airway noise, um, whether it be from, again, a foreign body, just inflammation, um, a polyp in the nasopharyngeal area. And then this, this here is actually my cat, um, who obviously has, you know, well, not obviously, but he has heart disease. And of course, he has to be a cat that coughs. He's purring as well. and I'm rubbing his butt. <laughs> okay. So a couple of other terminologies, especially what we use commonly when we speak to fellow technicians or the doctors to describe what's going on with a patient. Uh, first word is dyspnea. Um, so this is a subjective term to us because obviously animals can't communicate to us. So we can assume that the animal is experiencing some sort of breathing discomfort. Um, but the important thing is, is that it, it doesn't always have to be related to the respiratory system. They can seem dyspneic due to pain or nausea or just not feeling well. So dyspnea just means that they just look uncomfortable breathing or having some sort, you know, um, some sort of issue. Inspiratory effort, um, usually you're gonna, they're gonna be noisy. They might be slow, deeper breaths uh, or open mouth breathing. They may have neck or head extension and commissures of the lips extended so the ends of their lips are gonna curl up. Usually with inspiratory effort, it's gonna be an extra thoracic or outside of the thorax uh, problem that's gonna cause this effort. Whereas expiratory effort, you might have some wheezing, they're more deeper breaths, but uh, usually they're going to have an active abdominal component to this breath. Um, they might have a normal to slow or even a little bit higher of a respiratory rate. And these, this one's usually going to be intrathoracic, so within that chest cavity. You might have uh, rapid shallow breathing um, where they may or may not cough, but they're going to be easily fatigued and they may be reluctant to sit or lie down. Like they just might seem uncomfortable. Asynchronous breathing. Um, I actually have a video of this I'm gonna play uh, soon, but this one's really interesting. So when you normally take a deep breath in, your chest is expanding outwards. And when you exhale, your chest goes inward. With asynchronous, your chest wall moves inward during inhalation and then your abdomen is going to be expanding. So it's actually the opposite. It's really, really weird and interesting. And then the last one, my favorite one, um, is Kussmaul breathing. Um, so these are deep labored breaths, not due to hypoxemia. So there's nothing respiratory related, well, like, uh, 
uh, lung or trachea or anything like that related with this breathing. It is solely a metabolic breath. So uh, what you can think about is your severe diabetic ketoacidosis animals. They are so metabolically incorrect. They are taking very deep breaths and trying to expel as much CO2 out of their body as possible to correct their disbalance. Um, so it's amazing that you know the animal, you know your body is doing this mechanism to try to correct itself. Um, so again, oxygen, not that oxygen is ever a wrong thing to do, but these cases they really don't need the supplementation because they're only breathing that way to correct their their uh, status. So this, if you look closely and try to catch uh, it at the same time, how the chest wall is going inwards at the same time the abdomen is expanding. So this is asynchronous breathing. Really creepy and weird, but awesome at the same time. Okay. And then here we have a dog clearly in some sort of discomfort and distress. You can see how heavy he's really trying. I think he has a pretty much a little bit of both inspiratory and expiratory. He's trying to really breathe in hard, but he's also expelling hard. Um, he, you can tell by his face that he looks like he's in distress. He's upset, he's uncomfortable, he can't breathe very well. Okay, so physical exam findings. This, as a technician, um, is definitely one of the most important things um, to do while you're assessing a patient. Your basic TPR. It, he can have a normal temperature. He can be hyperthermic or hypothermic. You know, it doesn't matter. They can be either or. I will not stress this enough. The, one of the most important things that you want to do with your patient is exculpt your heart and palpate your pulses. Okay. Um, you can have a heart rate of 150 and a pulse rate of 130. And if you have that, um, you don't have that, uh, that synchronous heart rate and pulse rate, that might lead you to maybe an underlying cardiac disease. Um, and it might not be respiratory related at all. Um, you know, so you can't theoretically say, oh, yes, his heart rate is 150 only by checking his pulses. It's super, super important to check both of them at the same time to make sure everything is in balance. Obviously, if they're panting and you're able to close their mouth, you know, try to close their mouth so you can listen to the heart and lungs better. Um, they are definitely going to have an increased respirate. They might have a mild to moderate or pronounced respiratory effort. Their lungs may sound harsh. They might have a wheezing, which is high-pitched noise. They might have crackles, which is some popping. Or they may have absent or dull sounds in their lungs. You can even escort their trachea. So a lot of times people will say, oh, maybe they hear something odd in the lungs. But it's actually just referred upper airway noise from the trachea. Um, a lot of like the brachiocephalic breeds, you'll, you'll notice that, that you'll have a referred upper airway noise. It's not coming from the lungs. It's actually from above. Their gums, their uh, mucous membranes and capillary refill time, so they can be red or injected. They can have pale pink, pale cyanotic gray gums. Pretty much you just want to look at the patient um, because certain things might might point you to a certain direction. Like if, if their gums are pale, maybe he has an increased respirate because he's anemic and obviously he doesn't have enough oxygen circulating his body. Are they bright and alert when they present? Are they quiet, dull? Are they really stressed out? What recumbency are they laying in? Um, there's varying levels of distress that they can obviously um, come in and, and uh, be in. They could be in shock. And then most importantly, is there anything obvious in the nose, the mouth? Is there a facial deformity? And it's important to ask or get a history as, of, as to why they're actually presenting to the hospital. This picture here is pretty obvious that this cat has a facial deformity. Um, and so you can safely say that whatever, um, I'm assuming this cat had uh, some stertorous breathing, that it is all due to the large deformity on the front of his face. So super important to obviously just look at your patient and see if you see anything different or abnormal. There's some diagnostic testing that we can do. So obviously we're gonna do some basic blood work. Um, it may or may not be specific or significant to the patient, um, but a CBC, we wanna check if they're anemic or if they're polycythemic or they have an increase in red blood cells secondary to chronic hypoxemia. Um, so we don't see that really here, but in, in states that have like high elevation, 
um, or your chronic hypoxemia animals are going to be your heart failures or your chronic heart diseases. Um, we might see an increased white blood cell count from inflammatory response. Our chemistry, we want to see if there's any other functions that are abnormal. Are they, again, DKA? Um, are they in kidney disease, liver disease? What are their electrolytes looking at? So you just want to look at the whole picture. Radiographs, if able, um, using sedation, I think absolutely it always helps to get the stress off. Um, we would recommend at least two to three view of the chest and try to always include the neck. There can always be something up higher um, that we might be missing. Um, you can try to get a pulse ox on them again, but if they're usually just coming very stressed, uh, usually that's not something that we're able to get. Um, obviously, depending on how far we want to move forward with, you know, we can do advanced imaging. So a CT scan, an ultrasound, fluoroscopy. Um, we can scope the animal with a trach wash, see if it's something infectious or not. Um, we can send lab out to other, other labs such as, you know, PCR testing to check for viral infections, bacterial, fungal, uh, urine testing, serology, cultures, everything like that. So just because you think, you know, some people think, oh, maybe urine is not going to tell me anything, you know, it can. Um, so it's, it, it's important to just send out even at least just basic blood work in urine. Sometimes you need surgery. Sometimes we can do lung aspirates. Again, it all depends on uh, what we find with the animal. Most importantly, wait on diagnostics until your patient is stable. It is not worth getting chest x-rays if your patient is struggling so bad that when you try to position it, it's going to die. So most importantly, get them stable before you do anything else. His blood will still be there. We can get a catheter in anytime. We can get RADS done anytime. Does he need oxygen supplementation? Do we think it's heart failure? Do we give a dose of Lasix? Butorphanol, our favorite drug, it works so nicely, especially for these respiratory cases. Um, albuterol, so as an inhalant, um, or steroids. So again, this is something that you have to assess, and obviously it's more important to stabilize the patient before doing anything else. So I think we're going to move forward now to actual diseases. Um, so first we're going to start off again coming from the top and working our way down and we have, uh, as you can see from this picture first, there is something obvious with that cat. There is a little mass in his left nostril and it's pretty vague but the left side of his, of his uh, the bridge of his nose is a little bit higher than the right. Um, so our upper respiratory diseases, we're probably going to have nasal discharge. Um, it could be serous, so that could be normal, that could be nothing. It could be viral or an early sign of mucopurulent discharge. Um, if we have mucopurulent plus or minus hemorrhagic discharge, that can also mean a variety of things, viral, bacterial, fungal, parasites, foreign body, cancer, oral disease, rhinitis. And then we have epistaxis or bleeding from the nose. That could be from trauma, a foreign body, cancer, fungal, and other systemic diseases. So um, epistaxis does not only need to be related to the nose. Clotting disorders or vasculitis or even just systemic hypertension can cause that. So it's important to obviously evaluate the whole patient and not zone in on just the face. Um, they might be sneezing. And again, they might have reverse sneezing, um, usually nasopharyngeal irritation or otherwise uh, usually idiopathic. They're going to be stertorous. Um, they might have a facial deformity or they might be symmetric. Um, sometimes they can have chronic ear infections or discharge. Usually we'll see that with polyps. And then again, history is most important. Are they a super sniffy dog? Do they just go outside and their nose is right to the ground sniffing everything? Have they traveled anywhere, usually to the south um, or obviously out of the country? What's the home environment like and what's their age? So first we have rhinitis. Um, so rhinitis uh, can be caused by a variety of things. It could be allergic, it could be lympho uh, lymphoplasmacytic um, or inflammatory, or it could be bacterial. Obviously we have to diagnose that with nasal biopsies. Um, we can treat with antibiotics, steroids, antihistamines. Um, we will recommend environment change. Sometimes diet change if it is allergic. I've seen one cat 
um, with chronic rhinitis and once switched to a hypoallergenic diet, its uh, nasal signs went away. So it's definitely a possibility. Um, but rhinitis can be definitely very frustrating. Um, you can be on all of the drugs and the owners will still complain of nasal discharge and sneezing and, you know, there's nothing else that we can do. Um, I'm sure we have all seen a kitten like this who looks in coming in all crusty and gross. Um, and I'm talking about the feline upper respiratory infection. We all know it's either herpes or Khaleesi, but mycoplasma, chlamydia, or bordetella can also cause it. Usually it's an acute disease, um, but it can be a chronic thing and it can, um, it can go away and then certain, certain things can trigger it to flare back up again. Um, usually we like to do PCR testing. So it's a sterile cotton swab of the conjunctiva um, inside the nose and then a deep pharyngeal swab. Um, and that'll uh, let us know if it's positive for any of the viruses out there. Um, most of the time it's self-limiting, um, but we do do supportive care, give some antibiotics, plus or minus lysine, depending on how the doctor feels about it. Um, and then you might need ocular and nasal ointment or drops to kind of help them through it. But usually they will get over it themselves. Um, the nasopharyngeal polyp. So uh, this is what we see most commonly in young cats. Um, and usually it's associated with an ear. Uh, so that affected ear will usually have like chronic uh, discharge or ear infections. They might have neurologic signs or Horner syndrome. Um, and the way to fix that is that we have to pluck it out. Um, so pretty much what we do is we put them under anesthesia. We put them on their back and use a spay hook to kind of pull that soft palate away. And we pretty much pull that little uh, brain of a tissue out. Um, Usually we like to do this with a CT to make sure that there's nothing else going on. A lot of times we'll see if it's involved with the ear. Um, after a course of antibiotics and steroids, there's a 50-50% of recurrence. If it does, we do recommend uh, moving with, forward with surgery, a bullet osteotomy to kind of clear that inner ear canal out. Another thing that can happen is nasopharyngeal stenosis. It's pretty uncommon. Um, I've seen it in a couple cats though. Um, so it's an airing of a, the passageway in the nose. So it's obviously gonna cause stertorous breathing. Um, the only way to tell if they have stenosis is with a CT scan. Um, we can place a stent in that area to obviously open up that nasopharyngeal uh, um, area to so that air can flow through, uh, through normally again. Um, usually we do steroids to help with any inflammation, but again, it's pretty uncommon. Um, so then we have fungal and cancer uh, in the nose. So in dogs, normally we'll see aspergillosis. Um, it's actually a normal inhabitant in the nasal cavity, but in some dogs, it just becomes a pathogen, whether they just have an, a, uh, a weakened immune system for some reason that's allowed that, that normal flora to just overpopulate. You may, we'll probably see epistaxis and nasal discharge and definitely sneezing with these dogs. Um, the best treatment is what we call a clotrimazole infusion. As systemic antifungals don't really work in these dogs. You do, um, the best treatment is to put them under anesthesia. Um, it's actually uh, pretty annoying where that, um, it's always big dogs. Um, and you have to put uh, a Foley in the back of their coena to block off that nasal passage so no uh, medication falls down to the back of their throat. And then we in insert catheters in the front of their nose and then we infuse clotrimazole, um, which is just like a foot fungus cream that you get over the counter. And we infuse that in the nose over an hour and we have to rotate the dog every 15 minutes so that it soaks and covers um, the whole nose. Um, and we pretty much have to do this two to three times over a course of two to three weeks. So um, it smells, it's pretty awful, but unfortunately it's really the only best choice to treat fungal disease. Cryptococcus only really happens in cats. Um, you will probably see neuro signs. Um, you can have an infection of the nasal cavity. You can see it in the eyes and the skin. This one, thankfully, you can treat with systemic antifungals. So thank goodness for that. Uh, neoplasia, uh, one of the more common things that we see, obviously we see in both cats and dogs, usually older, but we have seen them in young uh, animals as well. Um, they can have facial asymmetry. Um, exophthalmus or one bulging more than the other. 
and then the inability to retropulse the eye. So when you um, push both eyeballs in, um, they should nice uh, push back gently and nicely and then just come back out. Um, the affected eye, there is a tumor on one side of the face, one eye will be resistant or won't easily retropulse or, or go back into the, to the face. Um, these tumors are usually slow growing, so by the time we get to it, it's pretty advanced. Um, you will see nasal discharge, plus or minus some hemorrhage. They will have some sneezing. Again, definitive diagnosis is with nasal biopsies, um, and then owners can choose whether they want to do chemotherapy radiation versus palliative care. And again, that all depends on what type of cancer it is. Usually we see lymphoma or sarcomas, or uh, carcinomas, I'm sorry. Uh, moving down to the laryngeal and tracheal area, um, we already know what's going on with these two uh, breeds of animals, these smushy face loves. Um, <laughs> with laryngeal and tracheal disease, uh, we're probably going to see some gagging or coughing, um, some dysphagia or retching. They might have a voice change. Um, they can have strider or stertor. Um, they will probably have an inspiratory effort, and they might be exercise intolerant. The most common thing that we see with these dogs is brachiocephalic obstructive airway syndrome. Um, so that includes stenotic nares and an elongated soft palate and averted laryngeal saccules. So bulldogs, boxers, Frenchies, pugs, anything that has a not normal face, <laughs> even cats, um, they are included in this brachiocephalic uh, syndrome. So heat is not good for them. As you know, like they get stressed so easily, it's hard for them to get air in. So we try to keep them out of the heat. Um, they might have GI signs. So th they might have vomiting and regurgitation due to the increased intrathoracic pressure. So as they're trying to breathe in and they're getting obstructed by their own tissue, that's causing almost like a vacuum. And so that might help, that might bring up some stomach contents or anything residual in the esophagus and make them vomit or regurgitate. Um, we can try medical management, um, so keeping them quiet, even if we need some sedation, um, keeping them in the cool during the summer. Um, the only way to fix it is an upper, wear, upper airway exam with surgical correction, so to open up the nares, trim the soft palate, remove the saccules if needed. Um, so our good old Labrador Retriever is kind of the poster child of laryngeal paralysis, um, which is failure of the retinoid cartilages to abduct during inspiration. A lot of times it's idiopathic, uh, but it can be uh, due to generalized neuromuscular disorders like uh, myasthenia gravis. It could be secondary to neoplasia, like thymomas can cause this. Um, they can have gagging or coughing while eating and drinking. Um, they usually present in an acute respiratory distress and uh, end up as a table dog. So they have to, we have to place a catheter, uh, give them propofol really quickly and intubate them and, and get access to that airway because obviously they're, they're closed off. Um, official diagnosis is with an upper airway exam. Um, with these guys, we definitely try medical management again, you know, with sedatives and things like that. Um, plus or minus surgical correction, which is that laryngeal tieback, but the owners need to know the risks. This is not, oh, hey, my dog has LARPAR, let's get a tieback. These guys have high risk for aspiration pneumonia, because um, if you're thinking about it, we're pulling that retinoid cartilage back permanently. So they can't close that anymore, so now they have an open airway. So this is not a benign surgery, and it's not something that you just want to recommend all the time to. Another poster child for tracheal collapse are good old Yorkie. Um, so tracheal collapse is narrowing of the tracheal lumen from weakened rings, or they might have a redundant membrane. It's either congenital or acquired. Uh, usually we uh, miss it during stress, um, you know, especially again when it's hot or they get really excited or a car ride, something like that, exacerbated from inflammation or, you know, obstruction. They can have a chronic progressive cough. These are the goose sounding like dogs. Um, they can have intra or extra thoracic collapse. So uh, the part of the trachea that's within the chest, that's intra versus the part of the trachea that's in the neck, that's extra thoracic. They can have collapse anywhere. These also usually present as a crisis. So we wanna give them oxygen, sedation, steroids, plus or minus intubation as well. These guys as well, we always want to try medical management first and for as long as possible. We 
don't want to play stents. As much as as much fun as stent placing is, we don't want to place it. They are not benign. We are placing a foreign body in the trachea, so they are still going to have complications, and sometimes they still cough. And again, they're still going to be on long-term medications, so we want to try to control the symptoms as close as we can. Just a little picture. It's kind of small, but if you can look closely, um, you can see the narrowing of the lumen. Um, this dog looks like it's uh, almost pretty much both intra and extra thoracic, um, that it's collapsed and then mostly in, uh, intra thoracic, his lumen opens back up. And then the picture of a stent placed in there. So it pretty much looks like chicken wire um, that, you know, it expands in there to open that trachea back up. But again, we want to avoid this as long as possible. Um, infectious tracheobronchitis, her kennel cough. So we all know the dog parks, uh, the daycare centers. Um, this is highly contagious. It's an acute disease. Uh, it could be viral or bacterial. Um, there's a sudden onset of severe non-productive coughing. They can have exercise exacerbation. Uh, pressure on the neck will also exacerbate that cough. Uh, they might be gagging or retching plus or minus nasal discharge. Most of the time they don't, but they can. Uh, again, this is also a self-limiting issue, but they can develop secondary issues like pneumonia um, if it just gets really bad. It can exacerbate other chronic airway diseases or tracheal collapse, so we do want to get this treated as soon as possible. Um, we do want to rest and limit the exposure to the outdoors or other dogs. Um, we can try cough suppressants, but maybe not if, if, if it's productive. Again, coughing is good. If it is a productive cough, we want them to get all that stuff out. Um, antibiotics, um, nebulization, so like a hot shower. Uh, sometimes you can buy a hand, uh, nebulizer to put towards their face. Big thing is we don't want to give these guys steroids because obviously if it is bacterial or viral, viral we're going to suppress that immune system and that's, that infection is going to go haywire. So no steroids for a kennel cough. Canine chronic bronchitis. So this is a cough that's occurring most days, longer than two months, absent of other active diseases. It's a slowly progressive disease. These guys are going to have that lard, hard cough um, with some mucus hypersecretion, but the cough itself may sound non-productive. The lungs are going to sound harsh. They're going to have crackles or wheezing. Uh, they will have some long-term inflammatory changes, so they might develop fibrosis or epithelial hyperplasia um, or inflammatory infiltrates. This, what happens is they create excess mucus plugs, obviously then causing obstructions. Sometimes these are irreversible. Um, so obviously now you're just going to have all of these little baby obstructions in your lungs, making it harder and harder to breathe. Uh, usually we see these in middle age to older, small, medium dogs like terriers, poodles, spaniels. Uh, most commonly we see Westies. They will, uh, Westies specifically get fibrosis. Um, so kind of a good thing to think about. Uh, anytime you see a Westie who's coughing, they probably will develop uh, fibrosis. Um, complications include uh, bacterial infections, pulmonary hypertension, bronchial, bronchial collapse, and bronchiectasis, which is permanent dilation of the airways. So bronchitis can definitely lead to a lot of other things. But treatment is very specific to the patient. Um, so again, uh, we want to try to see if it's an allergen, um, remove any irritants, maybe have an air, air purifier at home. Uh, we can try to nebulize them to keep that airway hydrated. If they are overweight, weight loss will definitely help. Um, and then drugs that we can try are bronchodilators, steroids, cough suppressants, maybe antibiotics, um, but we won't know that for sure unless you do an endotracheal wash to get a sample. Feline bronchitis and feline asthma, this is a big thing because pretty much every respiratory cat that comes in, everyone assumes automatically it's asthma, and it's not. Um, Feline bronchitis or feline asthma can look like so many other diseases. They can have toxo, they can have pneumonia. Commonly, it's overlooked a lot. They can have heartworm disease, um, which affects the lungs in cats. Um, unlike dogs, it does affect the heart. They can have a bacterial infection, fungal, or viral. Um, usually, cats will have some underlying airway in eosinophilia, so that's an allergen. Um, and they can have more than one one type of bronchitis. So they can have multiple things going on at the same time. These guys can get it at any age. They can have just a random cough or episodic respiratory distress or both. 
Uh, definitely environments can worsen the signs. So if they have really dusty litter or if you use a lot of fragrance, fragrance in the house, you will see an increase in effort. They might have expiratory wheezes um, or crackles. These guys, as you know, cats are sensitive. Please be careful with them. They're very stressed. Just wait and stabilize these guys. Give them some butorphanol. It'll change everything. Um, ideally, before slapping the label of asthma on them, please test for other diseases before deciding it's truly asthma or bronchitis. Um, in an emergency situation. You want to give oxygen, definitely. Maybe some steroids, obviously sedatives again, maybe some subcutaneous uh, terbutaline. Um, if we're going to change or improve the home environment, usually we'll see a response in about one to two weeks. Um, we can definitely try steroids, um, maybe some bronchodilators or inhalant therapy. So our arrow cat here. Um, never want to just give your cat a dose of Panicure for five days. Um, it's pretty benign. Uh, a negative fecal sample means nothing. Um, give them some Panicure. Sometimes you'd be very surprised. I actually just recently had a 20-week-old kitten who was coughing uh, so terribly, and his uh, chest x-rays were read out as asthma. And I was like, there's no way this 20-week-old kitten has asthma. So I told the doctor, I was like, please, let's do some Panicure and like some Clavamox. Started it. A, the cat pooped out a ton of worms, um, and B, he stopped coughing. So never, ever assume it's just asthma if you haven't tried anything else. And then obviously, if they fail to respond, we need to further investigate what's going on. So remember when I talked about the pulmonary circulation in the beginning, this is the disease that it's, that it's uh, important to kind of think about, um, is pulmonary hypertension. So... The left side of the heart has to pump harder to deliver oxygenated blood because it has to travel farther, meaning that's that blood going through the rest of the body. And the right side of the heart is lower in pressure because it only has to pump to the lungs, so the right side doesn't have to work as hard. We'll see pulmonary hypertension, mostly related to left-sided heart disease, um, so our valvular diseases, um, whereas when our valves thicken, they, they thicken up and they're failing. They're not closing and opening as well as they should be. You're going to have pressure buildup in the left atrium and in the veins, and that's going to increase the pressure in the lungs. Um, whereas if we have underlying respiratory disease, our, those vessels in the lungs can't dilate uh, appropriately, so we're increasing the resistance in those vessels. This is the increased pressure in the vessels are going to cause fluid to back up into the right side of the heart, causing the right side to pump harder. So if you think about it, if you have pulmonary hypertension from left-sided heart disease, you can develop secondary lung disease. If you have pulmonary hypertension from lung disease, you can cause that animal to go into to have right-sided heart failure or heart disease. Usually we see this more in cats than dogs. Um, common symptoms we see is lethargy, coughing, difficulty breathing, fainting episodes, ascites, and exercise intolerance. We diagnose it with an echocardiogram. Uh, we don't do cardiac cath in animals. It's pretty invasive and scary. So we just use an echo and it, uh, we find it just fine. Um, obviously we wanna try to find the underlying cause first and treat that. Um, we use obviously most commonly sildenafil or Viagra to dilate the pulmonary vessels. Um, I've seen in more refractory cases, uh, um, kind of a different drug to Dalafil. It's the same class, but a little, it works a little bit different. Um, or Cialis. These are both uh, human medications. Um, our pulmonary thromboembolism, or a PTE, um, an aggregation of platelets and other blood elements is called a thrombus, or an aggregate that breaks away from the origination site is an embolus. Um, and what, and a PTE is, is one of those that partially or completely obstructs blood flow. These animals, if they have a PTE or throw a PTE, this is a paracute respiratory distress. So super sudden, they can suddenly just die. Um, it's your patient that you've been monitoring all day. Vitals are fine, looks fine. All of a sudden, he's struggling to breathe. Most likely, he may have thrown a PTE. But this is a suspected disease. Um, it's really hard to test for. Um, we can only definitely, definitively diagnose it with CT, uh, specific CT scans. Um, but again, they can have none to minimal radiographic evidence. It's just all uh, with, with their behavior and the, and the suddenness of it. Um, I put uh, whatever, I'll do what I want because that's what PTEs do. They can be caused by anything. Post-op surgery, 
Cushing's disease, pancreatitis, neoplasia, IMHA, anything can kind of uh, make the body angry and, uh, you know, just throw a clot here and here and there and whatever. Um, it's definitely hard to treat. Um, there's a guarded prognosis with these animals. Um, you know, we need aggressive supportive care. Um, so oxygen therapy, IV fluids to help with their circulation, but also we have to monitor that we don't overload them. Um, bronchodilators, theophilins, denophil. Um, we've been also trying some fibrinolytic agents to break down the clots. So heparin or fragmin. Plavix, um, there's other newer ones, rivaroxaban and anoxaparin, um, to try to quickly break down those clots to, to open up that obstruction again. But these are definitely terrible. Um, and then in our pleural space, we definitely can get some fluid in there. So we have a couple different types of fluids, um, either your pure or modified transidates. So that can happen from right side of heart failure, pericardial disease, hypoalbuminemia, cancer, or diaphragmatic hernia or non-infectious or non-septic exudates, FIP, cancer, diaphragmatic hernia, or lung lobe torsion. Our septic exudates are going to be called a pyothorax. Our chylus effusions is going to be a chylothorax, and then our hemorrhagic effusions can be caused by trauma, a bleeding disorder, cancer, or lung lobe torsion. Now, a pyothorax um, is pretty much just pus or infection in the, in the chest. Um, um, it can be idiopathic. It could be from a foreign body, puncture wounds, pulmonary infections. So we definitely want to try antibiotics. We'll definitely need to do thoracocentesis, maybe chest tubes on them. Surgery if there's a foreign body or we need to explore as to what's going on. Um, a chylothorax. So chyle um, comes from the thoracic duct and it's a triglyceride or fat rich fluid that contains lymphocytes, protein and fat. Um, it can also be caused by, it, it could be idiopathic. It could be caused by inflammation, obstruction of the lymphatic system. It could be congenital or uh, non-congenital or traumatic. We do medical management versus surgery again. Sometimes we can try low-fat diet, uh, thoracocentesis as needed again. Um, there's a homeopathic drug called Rutin um, that theoretically should decrease the protein in the fluid to help um, the body to reabsorb that fluid. But... Uh, you know, so it's just kind of uh, you monitor the patient and see how they respond. Uh, so we have pneumothorax, which is an accumulation of air in the pleural space, and this can occur from trauma or something spontaneous, so a bullet, blebs, cysts. Yes, blebs is a real word. Um, supportive care, again, chest tubes if needed, or surgery. We might get mediastinal masses. Um, that can cause respiratory distress, and they can cause displacement of a lung or create effusion. Um, you may see coughing or regurgitation or even facial edema from these guys. Usually it's cancer. Um, we can definitely take an aspirate of the mass or, you know, more aggressively surgery to remove it if we can. A pneumomediastinum, um, the only way to say that a patient has that is uh, by looking at x-rays. Um, and it's usually from a rupture or tear in the esophagus, trachea, bronchi, or alveoli. Um, they can get secondary subcutaneous emphysema um, and or a pneumothorax. Um, but the they can usually actually heal pretty nicely and naturally as long as we rest them strictly, no neck leads, no pressure anywhere, just kind of let them relax um, and they can actually heal very well. But sometimes we do need surgical repair. So here's a picture. So this is a mediastinal mass. So if you can see that there is no lung um, in the cranial aspect of the thorax. So um, there is a huge mat, uh, mass there and it's kind of flowing together with the heart. So you can't really decipher between the two. Um, and then on the bottom, you see normal lung down there. Uh, this one's an awesome picture. So this is going to be our pneumomediastinum with uh, subcutaneous emphysema. Um, so this animal is pretty much a balloon. Um, all that black is air. So there is a leak somewhere. And it's obviously leaking air under his skin. And then, and then we have a picture of Fusion on x-rays, so the opacity on the bottom of the chest, that's all fluid. Um, near the top of the x-rays, you can kind of see the lung lobes nicely outlined. So that's when you know you, you have uh, fluid in the chest. You shouldn't really see it uh, marked well. Um, okay. I think, oh, I think I made actually good time. Uh, just a couple of videos to finish it off, um, just to kind of show different respiratory patterns.
this cat was a uh, post tracheal wash, so we've obviously made it more upset. But you can see she's neck stretching. She's really struggling to breathe. This lovely cat. Again, he's definitely having a hard time. Okay, and then for any exotics people out there, um, exotic animals definitely get respiratory disease and respiratory distress as well.